Hello everybody, this is Danny from Deep South Homestead. Um, what we're doing today is we're going to the code office because we're going to look into the, uh, the legal aspects of doing a shed into a small cabin or a tiny home um, in our location because we don't want to take any chances. We'd rather go talk to the code office and see what the ins and outs are. And we're going to kind of share a little bit of that with y'all whenever we um, get, out, get out of here and show you um, a little bit about what they tell us here, what we can and what we cannot do. All right, guys, we've just got back from town, going to the code office, and uh, we've learned an awful lot today about these small uh, cabins and um, sheds that needs to be converted. We have, uh, it's been kind of amazing, to be honest with you, as to all the rules and regulations and everything that goes along with these things. Now, let me say this. After going to the code office today, do not buy a piece of property in any given area without first going to a code office and talking to them if you plan on converting a shed into a living space. Because I had no idea here where I lived at of all the rules and regulations about converting sheds into a livable space into what they call a dwelling place. Now, fortunately, here in the county that I live in, in Mississippi, the, uh, the code director there, the guy that's over there, is just a great guy. I mean, he's easy to get along with. He's very knowledgeable. Uh, he's, he's a very, just, just a great guy to sit down and talk to. He's very informative. Uh, I told him what we were planning on doing here on YouTube. And he was more than willing to help. He, he answered any questions I had. Uh, we sit back. We had great conversation. Um, and this is what you want to do. If you're going to be moving into an area and you're going to be converting a shed or you're going to be building a tiny house, I mean, what I'm going to talk to you about today, has to, it's going to cover all these areas here. Um, you're going to want to create a relationship with your inspectors because... They can be your greatest friends, or they can be your worst enemies. They can make life for you real easy in building, or they can make it really difficult for you. So my advice to you is, after going today and, and talking with the gentleman, now I'm not going to mention his name because he did not give me permission to do that, but I'm going to just tell you, I feel like we're lucky in the county that we're in. We've got a great guy here, you know, for, for an inspector. Now... First off, don't believe what they tell you at these places where you buy these sheds about converting them into tiny houses or converting them into cabins or anything like that because guys, all they're interested in is selling the building because the places that I've been, the guys are like, oh yeah, you can convert these into living spaces. You can do this, you can do that, and la da 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 After talking to the inspector, that was all not accurate because there are specific rules in this county that must be followed. Now, Wanda and I are going to be doing ours, if everything goes all right, it's going to be a camp. It's going to be a place for like the weekend or a place for someone who can stay for a weekend or a day or two. It's not going to be a permanent dwelling place. And because of that, and because it's not going to hook up to the electrical grid system, uh, we don't have any rules or regulations on it. We're exempt from all that. Because if it's a hunting camp or a fishing camp or something like that, uh, then in this county, uh, you're, you're exempt. Now, let me tell you, what I'm telling you here today is only good for this county in the state of Mississippi. Now, it's going to be different where you're at. So don't take what I tell you today and go running off and say, well, Danny said we could do this and we could do that. No, you check your own codes in your area before you do anything. Like I said, don't buy land. Don't go buying a shed. The first thing you do is go to that code office and find out what the rules and regulations are for your area. Now, with saying that, I have a piece of paper in my pocket here. I'm going to go by this piece of paper and I'm going to show you just what I'm talking about here today. Now, 
This piece of paper that he gave me here is printed off code requirements for, now this is, this is the way it reads. These are general requirements for converting a prefabricated accessory structure into a single family dwelling place. The code office has already determined that people's going to be doing these things and they already have codes set up for them that must be followed. Now this is international code here that we're talking about. Number one, it must have a permanent foundation with a minimum size of 12 inch by 12 inch with two number four reinforcement rods in it. Now what that means is under each end of side of the shed that you're going to be putting down must be a footing poured 12 inches wide, 12 inches deep with two number four rebars through it sitting on rod chairs. Now they have to run the full length of the building. Like our building, if it's going to be 30 feet long, and I've got to dig a 12-inch wide foot and 30, 30 feet long on each side of this building for the piers to set on. And out of that concrete, wherever a pier is going to be, there's got to be a rebar sticking up so that when the blocks is put over it, they can be fastened directly to the concrete to meet code. This thing of going in there and just putting pads on the ground, he said, and blocking it up on top of it, you cannot make a permanent dwelling place out of that. Now, if you want to do a hunting camp that way, that's okay because there are really no restrictions on it. Number two, floor joists must be a two by six minimum. Actual span will determine the joist size. Now, you can't have anything smaller than a two by six floor joist. As remembered in the last video, we talked about a lot of these sheds have two by fours underneath them for floor joists. And here, the code requirement is they must have two by sixes no further apart than 16 inches um, underneath the flooring of a building. And, it, and based on the span, they must be braced evenly, like 16 feet, two by six. Uh, me and him talked about this. And really, a person should do, if it's a 16 feet across it, you should do one at the edge, eight foot and then do another one at 16 feet in order for the floor to be substantial to hold you up um, on it also uh, we talked about this on the flooring uh, one of the issues that we run into with these buildings that's uh sheds that's being converted is they put these four by six runners underneath them under the bottom of them, and they come about a foot and a half away from the edges of two feet and they put these four by sixes under them uh, that will not meet code requirement here uh, and here, in order for it to meet code requirement, the Forma 6 must be right along the outside edges of the building and then one in the center, or you must put some dead heads from the edge of the Forma 6 all the way out to the edge of the building and put a new band on the outside edge of the building and, and gusset plate this to the building in order for it to be substantial enough to pass code requirements here. So that tells us right there that, you know, a lot of these buildings are not designed for permanent dwelling places and, and they won't pass code here in, in our area. So number three, insulation minimums. Walls must have R13 insulation in it. Floors must have R13. And this is minimum insulation now. The ceilings must have R26 minimum insulation in them. Now, on this, there has been some upgrades in the codes, and the ceilings has moved up to R30, he told me. But um, they are still passing some R26 is simply because they're still using a certain code. They haven't upgraded to the new code yet. You want to keep in mind that one of the things that most people overlook in these uh, conversions from a shed to a livable dwelling place is the insulation and the flooring. Um, here where we live at, even though it doesn't get extremely cold, um, it's still a requirement to have the floor insulated um, if you're going to take a shed conversion. So if should we go with a shed conversion, um, then we'll have to insulate the floor on ours in order to make code requirement. Now, Number four, there is a minimum room size for 
bedrooms. Now, there, there has been some exceptions made for kitchens, halls, and bathrooms. But anything like a bedroom, there is a minimum space that is, re that is required by law. It must be a minimum of 7 foot by 7 foot in order for it to be a legal room that you can lay down and sleep in in this area according to code. Now, here's the thing that this is one of the things that, that gets us. Now, we're going to talk about this one probably a little more in depth because this one's going to really is the one that really kind of got me. Uh, I wasn't really aware of everything on this one. And it is that smoke detectors are required in the bedrooms and just outside the bedrooms. Smoke detectors must be hardwired and interconnected. All bedroom and smoke detector circuits must be on a arc fault breaker. Now, this brought up the question with us is can a person legally live off grid in this county, in this state? And the answer to that is no. Um, and let me clarify that. If you are disconnected from the power company coming in, then in order for you to legally have a dwelling place here, you must either have solar or you must have a generator. Because the, the smoke detector requirement says on the end, when you go into a bedroom, there must be one on the inside the bedroom up above the door. There must be one on the outside the bedroom up a door, above the door. They must be hardwired into an electrical system and they must be uh, battery operated on top of that. And they must all be connected together in the house. They can't be independently connected. In other words, if one, they've got to all be on the same circuit system. So that um, if they're in the event that there's a fire, they all let you know that there's a fire. Now, what that means is that you have to have a circuit panel in that house and you've got to either have a solar system hooked up to that house or you've got to have a house that, uh, or just a generator hooked up to it and running anytime that you are inside that house sleeping or anything like that there must be some sort of electrical system turned on in order for it to be legal because the smoke detectors detectors have to be hooked up both hardwired and battery backup now um, six. Minimum ceiling height is seven feet. That was one of the issues we ran into in a lot of these buildings. We noticed that the ceiling heights were, were extremely low in them. Now, if it happens to be a, a, a double story one, you got to make sure that top story is at least seven foot. The bottom story has got to be at least seven foot also. Anything less than seven foot will not pass code inspections here. Number seven, one exterior door is required and it must be a minimum of three feet wide, six feet, eight inches tall. Now this is one of the issues we ran into in a lot of these shed conversions that we were talking about. A lot of them, the door was too short it would not meet the actual height standard because a lot of the openings was just over six foot going was right at six foot going in a door because I had to duck my head to go in some of these especially these gambrel roofed ones and if you do not have a high enough ceiling that you can put a six foot eight inch door in then the front door will not meet code requirements so therefore it cannot be a dwelling place for a family unless the front door is three feet wide six foot eight inches tall so be sure and check that when you look at these sheds now number eight one window in each bedroom must have an opening of at least five square feet it must be at least 24 inches high and at least 20 inches wide now that's the reading that's the way it's worded right here when it's wide open that's in case you have a fire or anything like that, you can go out the window if you have to. Now, 
these y'all i know y'all are thinking right now these are probably some weird rules but guys look i'm telling you i've built construction my whole life this is nothing that i haven't had to follow anywhere i've ever worked in the united states these are just national code laws it just so happens where we live at they're called international because there's some there is some stipulations that national code laws don't have that the international ones do have now Number nine says receptacles in damp locations must have a ground fault circuit, inter uh, a GFCI protection breaker. Now these guys, these are in places like um, the kitchen, the bathrooms, the outside receptacles. They must be a ground fault circuit. Now in an interceptor, uh, guys, this is just this is just wisdom. If you're going to have any type of electrical outlets in these houses, then they need to be those type of outlets. Um, therefore, once again, if you don't, and you got to read into this, if you don't have these things in a house, then it cannot be classified as a legal dwelling place. If you have a kitchen and you don't have receptacles, then you can't classify it as a livable dwelling place because it doesn't have the code receptacles in it. It must have them, even if it's hooked up to solar or a generator. The kitchen must have a working sink in it. Now this brings in, and we're going to talk, we're going, let me go ahead and, the kitchen must have a working sink, and let me go ahead and talk about the bathroom, and this is going to kind of tie together here. Number 11, must have a bathroom with a working toilet and a working shower stall or a tub now the kitchen must have a working sink and you must have a bathroom inside the house that has a working sink i mean a working toilet and a working bathtub or a shower unit let's talk about the bathroom for just a minute here um the bathroom has got to have a working toilet and a working tub or a shower inside the inside the cabin or the tiny house it can't be outside they have to be functioning. The kitchen sink has to be functioning. And in this area, you cannot let the gray water drain out on the ground anywhere. It must go into a septic system. So, in order for it to be a dwelling place for a single family, you must have an approved septic system. Now, here the septic system is not tied in with the code office. The septic systems here are handled by the health department and the code department literally accepts whatever the uh, health department says is okay. One of them does not bleed over onto the other one. So in order to live under our rules and regulations here, and you're going to convert a shed into a, uh, a, a tiny house or a, a single family dwelling space, whether it's 50 feet long or whether it's 20 feet long, uh, you've go you're going to have to have a septic system and you're going to have to have a functioning toilet shower and kitchen sink inside the house so these are some things guys that that most people never talk about when they talk about converting these sheds into tiny homes as far as what the code requirements are in specific areas now another thing that it talks about here number 12 is that the house must have hot water you can't you can't not have hot water now well, it can be an on-demand gas one uh it can be an on-demand electric one uh it can be solar it can be these type things guys but you your house in order for you to live in it must have hot water in it number 13 it must have heat now there are some rule there are some stipulations about the heat it can be wood heat it can be gas heat um, even that the video we did here the, the right before this one where we had the AC heater and all that in one unit it can be that but what it cannot be it cannot be one of these little standalone space heaters that you put on the floor they will not accept that and the uh, the guy explained to me that they measure at a window, they measure three feet up off the floor and three feet, three feet back toward the wall. And it must be inside that area, must maintain 68 degree temperature inside it in order for the heat source to be legal. You cannot live in it if it does not meet those requirements. 
And I know he and I talked about this. Um, it seemed a little silly. We don't know how they come up with that figure, but uh, it is what it is. It's the code here. Now you can have a fireplace, like I said. You can have a you can have a gas heat. You know, you can have a heat pump. You can have all these things, but you just cannot do the little small standalone space heaters. That's not permitted. Now the last thing here about this is, and this is the one that's probably going to be the the sticker of the whole deal, is number 14. It says you must have a manufacturer's construction plan bearing an engineer seal of the state of Mississippi stating that the design criteria exceeds 125 mile an hour after three, uh, three second gusts and it has to be an exposure B category. Um, these things that we've just read off here it says is to give uh, the owner a basic understanding of what is required to convert one of these uh, portable buildings into a single family dwelling place. Now, what that simply means is this, guys. If you go to one of these places and you purchase one of these storage buildings and you plan on turning it into a single family dwelling place, before it ever leaves the lot, you have to already know the design of the interior walls and where every window in that thing is going and you have to have an engineer to go ahead and sign off on it with his stamp in order for the code inspector to accept it as a single family dwelling spot. If you go there and that thing is sitting on a lot and it has a stamp on it and you bring it home and cut one window hole out in it somewhere else, uh, it's not acceptable after that point because you have just changed the structure by adding a window into it or a door into it and therefore it will not meet code requirements anymore. You must have a stamped engineer's seal on it based on the design that you want and all the things that we just talked about here. The engineer must sign off on this shed in order for you to get a occupancy permit here in order to be able to live inside a single family dwelling uh, shed as, as we're going to call it that. One thing that, uh, that we talked about um, that he mentioned here is make sure that the engineer that stamps this is from the state of Mississippi. Mississippi does not accept any stamps from any other state. Uh, if the building was built in Ohio or Michigan or Tennessee and they stamped it there and said that it's according to the building codes and meets their requirements, you bring it here, it will not pass. It must be stamped from an engineer from this area, from this state, in order for it to pass the code requirements, in order for you to get an occupancy dwelling permit. Now, let me tell you a little bit about what our plans are here. I'm in the process of, I'm doing some material list. I've got some uh, phone calls out about material to see about either building my own with some help um, or going back to the uh, the shed place where they sell these buildings and sitting down with the owner and showing him my design and getting him to take it to his engineer and having the engineer to design it to the specifications that I give him based on these requirements right here and having that engineer sign off on it if he's willing to do that then we would be willing to purchase a building from them to convert into a single family dwelling spot. Now, granted, Wanda and I are not gonna be living in ours. Guys, we don't have to follow any of these rules, to be honest with you, because it would just be a hunting camp for us. But for the benefit of you guys here on our channel, Wanda and I are probably going to stick our neck on the line. We're probably gonna go ahead and set this thing up as a dwelling place even though we're not going to dwell in it it's going to cost us a ton more money but in order to give y'all the experience that you need and show you how things are to be done uh, we're probably going to go that route and, I, and, and and also it's just a simple fact that if something was to happen to my house and I needed to be able to live there then if I go ahead and follow the rules up front 
and go ahead and set it up for a single family dwelling even though it's not when that day comes if it should ever come then we wouldn't have anything to worry about all we'd have to do is call the uh, inspector and tell him that it was no longer a camp and that it's going to become a dwelling place and he would come out and do an inspection on it and he would either pass us or fail us but he should pass us if we follow all the rules here that he gave me and then we could we would get an occupancy permit stating that we could live in it so guys there's um there's lots of rules that goes along with these things like the insulation for instance uh, you don't really want to be putting fiberglass insulation inside these little shed buildings that you're going to be living in because the fiberglass insulation uh, should these buildings sweat that fiberglass insulation gets wet it gets waterlogged and it will create mold on the inside of these walls you need to really be using a, a product called rock wool it's a it's a waterproof stuff it's fireproof um, the inspector and I talked about this and uh, he strongly encouraged going that route um, over just plain fiberglass insulation now they won't fail you if you put fiberglass insulation in it but he highly recommends that you go with the rock wool um, insulation just simple just for the simple fact that it's green it's good for the environment it's uh it's fire retardant it's water repellent it's all these things that uh, really these buildings guys they're just they're not built like houses are built and they will sweat worse than houses sweat um, so some of the things I've showed y'all here today is basically just good building practices and uh, these are codes that I've followed just about everywhere that I've built and I've never had a problem uh, after Hurricane Katrina I never lost a structure I didn't lose a roof I didn't lose anything because I followed I followed the building codes so make the code inspector your friend um, go sit down with him don't get upset if he starts telling you this stuff and feel like oh I you know I ought to be able to do this and I ought to be able to do that no guys if you can't live by the rules where you live then move somewhere else and go somewhere else because uh, where there's less restrictions I guess uh, like where we're at here there's really not that many restrictions we're just under international code and when you're under international code you have to abide by the rules so and they're not bad rules everything I've read to you here today is a safety factor and for the safety of you and your family it's worth it to follow these few rules because there's nothing here that I've read you that's out of the ordinary um, they're all good uh, I don't see anything wrong with any of them you know our particular one we're gonna put a composting toilet in it he didn't have a problem with that as long as it is a hunting camp fishing camp or a weekend place but now if I ever decide to make it a permanent dwelling place if I ever decide to make it a permanent dwelling place then I'll have to put a working toilet in and a working shower and I'll have to put a septic system in and all this stuff which I don't mind that at all if I'm going to be living there guys make sure when uh, you know when you get ready to do this go to your building code office sit down with the inspector talk with him find out what the rules are in your areas and guys don't be don't get upset with the guy he's just doing what he's supposed to do that's his job um, and the things that I've read you here today just good common sense I've built by them my whole life uh, I highly recommend all of them so when we get a chance to do our uh, construction whether we buy a shed or whether we build our own we will be following these instructions that I showed I read to you here today Check your own out in your own area. Don't take my word for it. These are what works here. Um, do what you need to do in your area. And I hope today's been informational about the shed conversion to single family dwelling. Thank you from Deep South Homestead.